Beverly. Um, thank you, Councillor, for uh, what was a fantastic uh, introduction. Um, I think what uh, uh, what Councillor Aitchison was saying about atmospheric archaeology is, cer is certainly something that resonates with me, and uh, uh, obviously not born and bred in the in the borders. Um, but every time I go up to uh, a, a new hill fort that I haven't visited, or or uh, even a farmstead or some, something, uh, I definitely get a feel of the place. And I, I think that's something that, that, uh, that we all do. Um, and it, it is something that's important about um, the heritage of these places, that intangible feeling that you get. Um, so, uh, so thank you, Councillor. appreciate that. I'm, I'm, uh, oh, and, and welcome to you all as well. Thank you for coming down. This is fantastic turnout. Uh, really appreciate everybody coming down and making the effort on a, on a Saturday. Um, I'm talking today about the underexplored archaeology of the borders. Now, when I'm saying underexplored, um, it's not unexplored. The, the, the borders has a long and rich heritage, and there's a, there's a long and rich history of archaeology in the borders. By underexplored, I really mean in the last 50 years, uh, research, research objectives in particular have shifted away from the borders. Um, so we've largely missed out on a lot of the um, uh, the fantastic archaeology that's taken place in Scotland in the last 50 years, places like Orkney and, um, and uh, you know, Perthshire and places like that have really benefited from that. Um, but what I'm hoping to encourage today is that we shift our focuses back to the south, where the archaeology is as rich, if not richer, than many other parts of, of Scotland. Oh, you can't see it, good. <laughs> The, the history of archaeology in the borders um, goes right back to the beginning of the antiquarian movement and, and the, the, uh, you know, this, this, this drive to understand the heritage of where you're at rather than going on a grand tour to Europe or Africa to see the, the archaeology of the Romans, um, to focus on the ruins that are right at your doorstep. Um, and this, this movement goes right into the, into the, you know, the middle of the 18th century. <clears throat> and it encouraged people like J.M. Turner to come uh, and, and view things. It helped that there was a certain person here who encouraged these folks like J.M. Turner to come and stay with him at Abbotsford. Um, and, uh, and because of that, we have these fantastic sketches of places like Alice Shields. Uh, you Are Here is probably right in the middle of that, <laughs> that sketch. The borders, obviously, as, as uh, Councillor Aitchison mentioned, is, a, is in a, a vast area. Uh, you know, obviously, when the, when the, the regions um, were brought together in the 90s, it incorporated a, a, you know, several smaller areas, and, and, and it became this, uh, this fairly large area. Uh, I like to joke, when I, when I first got um, the job, when I was interviewed, uh, I was shown a map of the borders, and it was uh, sort of, all this can be yours. and, and uh, I, I think I probably didn't know enough at the time of <laughs> what all of this actually meant. Uh, but it's a, it's a very large area to cover. And we do have some extremely rich riches in the borders. Uh, we have things like uh, one of the largest hill forts in northern Britain on the top of Eildon Hill, um, with all of those dimples in the, in the snow being the places of roundhouse huts uh, that people used to live uh, in or, or maybe not live in, maybe just go up there for festivals or whatever, depending on who you believe about hillports. Uh, we have um, an extremely strong uh, early medieval presence in the borders, uh, places like Ruberslaw, which has uh, what we think might be an early medieval stronghold uh, on, on the top of Ruberslaw, maybe sixth century. But then also we have the Anglo-Saxon, uh, Anglian, Northumbrian archeology, span which is almost completely unexplored, although there was a fantastic excavation up in East Lothian uh, last month at Aberlady, which is one of these little hints about how incredible the archaeology of the southeast of Scotland can be in this period, uh, but we need much more of it. We have, of course, the Roman uh, presence in the borders, and in particular Newstead, uh, the site of Trimontium, uh, which you can see off to the left there with its, um, with its ramparts and barracks all underneath the plow. And of course, Newstead ext extends almost all the way to, to Newtown St. Boswell's where there is a, a large vicus 
uh, extramural settlement probably for the baggage train as they lived there for 25 years with the legions. We have the largest Roman camp, um, maybe not in the entire Roman Empire, but certainly in Europe, at St. Leonard's near Lauder, and that's up, up on, the, on the right. Um, you can only get an impression of it because you can't actually, you'd, have, you'd almost have to be at 20,000 feet to get a picture of the thing, um, but the camp actually extends over um, quite a few square kilometers. And then we have re well, really well-preserved archaeology, uh, Roman archaeology at Line Fort. Of course, we have Deer Street as well, running from York to, uh, to Inveresk, and it, ex it extends right the way through the borders, and all along um, Deer Street are Roman camps, Roman temporary camps as the legions were on the march into, into Scotland. Um, and then, you know, for a time being actually within the Roman Empire here behind the Antonine Wall. In the Cheviots and in Tweeddale in particular, we have an incredibly rich collection of Iron Age archaeology, Iron Age and Bronze Age, places like Woden Law, um, which is sitting right on the border, um, Deer Street running underneath it. You can imagine the Roman legions as they, they're sort of marching below this, this incredible fortress up on the hill. Um, and, and camping just below it at Penny Muir. Um, places like um, Dromelier in, uh, in Tweeddale, exceptionally rich Iron Age archaeology on the hills um, and, uh, and, and, and an, an incredible collection, but underexplored in that we don't have chronology for any of these hill forts. We don't have uh, carbon dates and, and that, that sort of thing to tell us exactly when these things were made, were they all lived in at the same time, or is it a succession of, of different occupations at these places? And that's something we desperately need. We have an incredible, obviously, medieval archaeology and late medieval archaeology, places like Dry Up Tower in Yarrow. We have the towers, the vassals, the castles, uh, you name it, we've got them. Of course, we have the border abbeys as well. Uh, Dryborough, Jedburgh, Kelso, um, Melrose, of course, uh, and then some of the smaller ecclesiastical settlements like Coldstream and, and uh, Abbey St. Bathans, places like that. Very, very rich uh, Christian heritage in the borders. We have a lot of places that have gone almost unnoticed. Um, places like Little Castle near New Castleton or Old Castleton, if you know it well, uh, which is an immense castle with, a, with tremendous earthworks around it. Um, but maybe because of where it is relative to transport, it's a bit hard to get to. People haven't really looked at it before. And sitting right next to it is the site of Old Castleton, uh, a, a medieval village right, right next to it with a, with a, a market cross still standing up. <laughs> Uh, uh, where, the, where the cows go. We have an entire uh, medieval borough preserved under the fields at Roxburgh, uh, arrested in time, unlike most of the other, in fact all of the other Scottish boroughs which have been built on successively over time. Roxburgh is there, preserved for us, um, and, uh, and, and sitting there um, just right next to the to the showground in Kelso. We have the first ever Tras Italian fort in Britain uh, at Eymouth, and uh, it's also the site of um, a French fort. So the English built a fort there, and then the French built a fort there in the 1540s, uh, and it became an, an absolute uh, horror for Elizabeth the I, um, who was, was bemoaning the fact that the French had dared build a fort at Eymouth, um, so she decided to fortify Berwick as a result. Everybody has been to Berwick, everybody has seen the fortifications of Berwick. Few people go up past the caravan park in Eymouth to have a look at this Tras Italian fort, but thanks to the friends of Eymouth Fort, we're, that's beginning to change. In Carley Mill in Innerleithen, we have uh, the first custom textile mill in Scotland. Um, it's now sitting derelict. Um, most of the buildings around it have now been demolished with, for a, a housing development, 
but the A-listed building is sticking around and hopefully we can find a use for it. And we have the more prosaic archaeology, um, one of only two listed pissoirs in, uh, in Scotland, uh, in Walkerburn, and uh, I believe you can still use it if you want to, if you're going for a walk around Walkerburn, I although I avoid it on a Saturday night. <laughs> As I said, the, 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 the history of archaeology and antiquarianism goes right the way back to the beginnings of the study of, of, of Scotland's heritage and Scotland's built heritage and, and the ruins around. Um, we're seeing it and that knowledge showing as early as 1770 on Matthew Stobie's map um, where you've got a picture of the, the Eildon Hills there and right next to it it says Camp because they felt it was a Roman camp up on the hill rather than an Iron Age hill fort. Um, interestingly, Newstead sits right below it. Um, no knowledge whatsoever at this point of the Roman fort that lay beneath the, the plowed fields there at Newstead. Um, but that sense of antiquarianism, that sense of, of the, the, the history and the, 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 the wealth of, of knowledge that's preserved in the ruins of, of Scotland, it, it, it has its roots in the South and the Southeast because, of course, many of the Enlightenment figures who were antiquarians, um, well, they had residences in places like the borders in East and Midlothian. Um, they, they traveled down here often. Um, they, it, was, it was accessible. And that accessibility led to uh, a, 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 almost a, an early grand tour of the borders. People like uh, General Roy, um, who developed the first ever re truly ordnance survey in, in the 1750s, uh, was also a, a keen antiquarian himself, and uh, he drew up a map of the Roman um, military fortifications in Northern Britain. He also felt that the hill fort on the Eildon Hill was, was Roman, so he, he put it on his map and he gave us a very detailed look at uh, uh, what he saw on the ground in the 1790s. And then we have this eccentric character, uh, David Erskine, the 11th Earl of Buchan, uh, who lived at Dryborough. And um, he was a very uh, learned man, and he, uh, he was, a, was a very, very keen antiquarian and actually founded the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland in the 1780s. Uh, but he also had this sort of, well, we wouldn't want to call it nationalistic, but a, a very, very deep view of, 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 of Scottish history and Scottish identity. Um, and so he um, put up the, the statue of William Wallace, the first statue of William Wallace to be erected in Scotland, um, just to drive her up. You can still go visit it today, um, but he also, had a knowledge of Northumbrian archaeology, and in the walls of Dryborough Abbey, if you look hard enough, you'll see strange Anglo-Saxon script written into the walls, and, and that's their old fucking basically trying to make it look older than it actually was. Graffiti. Of course, the, the most important antiquarian um, in terms of, you know, how the border's history and archaeology was, was given off to the world was Sir Walter Scott, and he wrote all of his novels. Um, you know, to, to an extent, have a sense of his knowledge and his, his love of the border's heritage embedded within it. Uh, in, in particular, The Antiquary, which uh, I, th I seem to remember is, is, um, is actually reflecting the Earl of Buchan a bit. Um, as this eccentric character, and there's a love triangle and all of this, you know, typical Scott. But uh, it's it, you know, it's, Scott really, in his, with his collections and with his his travels around the borders and with his encouraging friends like J. M. Turner to go out and look at the archaeology and the heritage of the borders, um, Scott is an ambassador for the borders heritage in the 17 uh, early 19th century. And it created, Scott and his novels, like Waverley, created a tourism uh, of heritage in the 19th century. People would come from all over the world to the borders to visit places like Melrose Abbey. Uh, it helped that there were good trains at the time, 
um, but also, you know, people would board coaches and go up um, to see, uh, you know, places like um, uh, the castle at, at Bow Hill, and uh, you know, and, and just tour around and, and see Scott's world. Um, even long after he died, people were coming to the borders, having read his novels. The Society of Antiquaries, as I mentioned, was founded um, by the, the Earl of Buchan, um, 1780. A lot of the early studies that the Society did um, was of borders archaeology. We also had our own homegrown uh, archaeologists, community archaeologists, and we had the Berwickshire naturalists, that's naturalists, not naturists, slightly different. Um, and uh, they were founded in the 1830s. The Hoyk Archaeological Society founded in the 1850s. Um, and then societies of history and archaeology um, being founded right the way into the 20th century. The Old Gallic Club, of course, founded in the 1950s. Um, you know, to the Peebleshire Archaeology Society founded in the 1980s, I believe. In terms of the history of archaeology itself, uh, you can't get two bigger figures than the brothers Curl, uh, James and A.O. Curl, who were both from Melrose. They both lived at uh, Priorwood, right on, the, on the, the footstep of the ruins of Melrose Abbey. They would have woken up every morning seeing this, this tremendous ruin out their front door. <coughs> that had a profound influence, plus their father and grandfather um, were antiquarians. In fact, their grandfather was uh, one of Scott's lawyers. So they had a very deep and rooted, um, profound love of Borders archaeology, which eventually led to James Curl excavating Newstead, the turn of the 20th century. Um, that's the, the fantastic uh, Roman parade helmet from Newstead. Uh, and it led to A.O. Curl excavating Treprain Law, Founding the, uh, or finding the, uh, the Treprain treasure there, um, which went around the world. Uh, this treasure was seen as, as one, of the, one of the gems of Scottish archaeology. And the Borders archaeology continued right into the 20th century, being at the forefront of, 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 uh, of research agendas. The first ever Royal Commission, Ancient Historical Monuments, sadly no longer exists. Um, their first inventory of, of archaeology was Berwickshire. We had some of the greats of world archaeology, like V. Gordon Child excavating in the borders, and he excavated at Ernst Hugh near Colding. Uh, we had uh, some of the, the post-war archaeologists, like Stuart Pickett excavating, and doing, doing some phenomenally um, forward thinking and progressive work on the archaeology of the borders, he excavated Hunum rings, uh, and to this day people still use the Hunum model of progressive development of hill forts um, to describe how, how hill forts developed from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age. Um, and, 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 and Stuart Pickett was using borders archaeology to drive forward that research agenda. And then we have sort of you know, the, 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 this antiquarian movement moves into community archaeology, and, and, it, and, it, and it's that deep love that Scott had, and um, the Curls had, of archaeology and heritage of the borders um, has continued to this day. And I'm happy to say Walter Elliott's in the audience with us, um, and, and Walter, many of you will know, uh, is, is a font of knowledge, knows every field of the borders, um, and, uh, and, and knows more in his pinky than I will in my lifetime. Uh, and then we have other folks who are in the audience with us as well, uh, who helped develop the archaeology of the borders. Pierce Dixon developed the historic environment record in the 1980s, but also um, did sterling work with the, uh, the Scottish uh, the Borders Borough Surveys and our excavations. Um, John Dent, who was here in the in the 90s and early 2000s as as the regional archaeologist, and also um, helped with this uh, excavation of Trimontium and, and, the, and related settlements around Trimontium in the 80s and 90s, which will hopefully be published at some point in the next five years. Uh, and then Rory MacDonald, who succeeded John, and then of course I succeeded Rory. Um, we have community groups who have developed museums 
devoted to the to the archaeology of, of the borders. Uh, the Trimontium Trust have their th Three Hills Museum in Melrose, uh, the only Roman museum in Scotland dedicated to the Romans, uh, but it's hopefully also one that will be redeveloped uh, in the near future. We have the Friends of Imeth Fort, who are a, a newcomer to the community archaeology of the borders, um, who have been doing their, well, more, more than their level best, their, their incredible bunch, have been creating this digital um, understanding of, of, um, of Imeth Fort um, by way of Xbox, and you can go to the museum in Imeth, play the Xbox, talk to French soldiers as you're, as you're walking through the fort at Imeth. Um, we've had some other people interested in the borders archaeology recently. Uh, Time Team excavated at Roxburgh uh, around 2005, was it, I think? Um, the only excavations to have taken place at Roxburgh. And that leads me on to what I do. Um, I curate and manage, maintain, and update the, the historic environment record, which is a record of everything that we know about the borders archaeology. And it really is a research tool more than anything else, because every time I look at a new planning application, which is my main, main job, it's a research, um, it's a research uh, project in itself. Uh, most archaeology, as it's been done over the last 50 years, is development-led. Uh, we've had work recently at Sutra, um, along at Philip Hawk, um, and then also around the Falago Rig wind farm, which has developed some incredible archaeology out of it. Um, the struggle is, and this is where the underexplored part comes in, this is all unfocused, ad hoc archaeology. No, there's no synthesis, there's no bringing it together, um, and that's something we desperately need. Uh, and it's also um, something that's not research-led, largely. Um, we do have some, uh, some excellent work trying to bring things together and, and build new things. Um, I showed a picture of Coldingham there for a, for a second, um, where there was a great project um, to, uh, to interpret Coldingham Priory for the public. We have um, at Ancrum a new, a brand new, as of last week or two weeks ago, uh, Heritage Society, the Ancrum and District Heritage Association. Society. Um, so if you're if you're interested, um, they're in the room, so you can talk to them. Uh, but we're trying to look for this bishop's palace in in uh, in Ancrum, plus all of the other incredible archaeology around Ancrum. Um, we've been doing a lot of geophysics recently because we need to actually start understanding the resource that we have. We've had geophysics done at Selkirk Old Parish Kirk, where we think we now have the footprint of uh, the chapel where Wallace was made guardian of Scotland within the, the ruined walls of the church itself. Um, we've had some, ex some uh, geophysics done at, at Philip Hawk, um, where it looks less like an Anglo-Saxon settlement, which people thought it was, and more like a medieval settlement and possibly something really strange going on in the southeast corner of the field. Um, we've been running a Borders Heritage Festival now for uh, six, seven, eight years. Um, but this festival is growing and growing. This year we have over 100 sites represented. Um, and on the back of this, we're also developing a Borders Heritage Forum. Um, and the forum really will be um, doing several things. It'll be running the festival, but it'll also be looking at trying to grow the economic and tourism um, of the Borders, uh, the Borders Heritage, and trying to encourage those people um, who used to come in droves when Scott was alive, encourage folks back down to the borders and look at the incredible resource that we have. Um, just within the next couple of weeks, we'll be starting a, a polygonization project. That means drawing lines around things. Uh, the earlier picture I showed of the historic environment record had dots. We're hoping to actually take those dots and say what those dots actually represent. Um, and somebody will be, will be soon joining us at the council to do that work for 20,000 records, so it's quite a task. And finally, um, I'll leave you with perhaps the biggest news. We are in the process of scoping a uh, Southeast Scotland regional research framework. For the first time, we'll be looking at the Southeast of Scotland as a whole and understand, try to understand what we know, what we don't know, which is a lot. 
and try to actually pin those down into research objectives and encourage researchers to come back to the south and start looking at this archaeology again. So the Southeast Scotland Regional Research Framework, or CSARF, um, will be launching hopefully next year. And uh, those of you who are in community groups, we are desperately trying to make this a community-driven um, uh, um, research objective as much as anything, because we realize that, that you, know, you on the ground are actually doing a lot of the work. Thank you again. Thank you for coming to Gala Shields, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day, and we'll, we'll see some, some great examples of Borders archaeology throughout. Thank you.